Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Christina. You can also call me Raid Experim, which is of course the name of my channel. I recently published a video about 10 warning signs of a recession and what you can do to prepare for that. And the economic outlook continues to be pretty dire. We now see inflation soaring to 9.1% in June. This is the highest inflation numbers in the past 40 years so let's go ahead and get into that by the way if you are new to my channel uh, please consider subscribing um, I try to cover kind of breaking news stuff and I try to cover underreported stories and things that I think are important that maybe other people aren't talking about so you can see here these are the inflation numbers year over year um, in the consumer price index you can see we had this high inflation the last time was in the 1980s and so you can see here look how high it is now 9.1 percent in june plus 5.9 percent excluding food and energy and i think everyone can see where things are headed so I want to bring this up. This is from Disclose.tv on Gab, just in the Euro falls below dollar parity. Unsurprising, <laughs> you know? Um, so there's that. And I thought this was very smart. This is from Sven Hen Henrich uh, on Twitter. First, they created a massive asset bubble, leaving the poor in the dust, pricing them out of the housing market. This is something I discussed in my last video, which I encourage everybody to watch if you haven't watched. It's around 40 minutes long, and I know that can be kind of long for some people. If you're a fast reader, I have linked my article uh, in the video description on that, so you can just kind of read the article if you kind of you know want to go don't want to watch a 40 minute video i know it's a little bit long but i also include things that you can do some solutions and how you can kind of prepare yourself because while recessions are bad there's also a lot of opportunity during this time if you are prepared so go ahead and check that out uh, and subscribe to my Substack. Uh, it's radixverum.substack.com you'll get um, a notification every time i publish an article there and he continues, then they crushed the poor with inflation. Next, the poor will be the first to lose their jobs as they tighten into a recession. What exactly is the role of the Fed? So that, <laughs> that's a really good comment. And already people are losing their jobs. In my prior video, I covered mass layoffs that are happening and hiring freezes. And you know, we've heard things like from the World Economic Forum, they want to do a great reset. They want to usher in the fourth industrial revolution, which will include a lot of automation and will phase people out of the workforce, which people like Yuval Noah Harari have referred to as useless eaters. That's how they see you. And then they'll say condescending things like learn to code or just develop another skill, right? As if it's that easy. So Charlie uh, Bellelo says global inflation rates, and he's put together a little chart here of the consumer price index. This is inflation year over year by country. You can see Saudi Arabia, China, Japan, Switzerland, Taiwan, Indonesia, Australia, Singapore, France. And so it goes from least to greatest. And check out where the U.S. is down here, guys, right with the U.K. Pretty crazy. Um, and of course, you can see Russia here. That makes sense because of the current um, debacle with Russia in the Ukraine. And so this here is all countries inflation rate over 15 percent. And um, so go ahead and look at that. That's pretty crazy. This is a global downturn. It's not just something affecting the United States. I kind of thought this was ridiculous and silly. You know, the mainstream media they're so awful <laughs> they're so condescending and arrogant and rude to the average person they had the audacity to publish this in their finance section pay raises are getting smaller that could be a good thing for workers why would that be a good thing P uh, 
wages have not gone up in alignment with inflation. The cost of living continues to rise and wages are stagnant. Slower wage growth could help bring down prices and ultimately mean less sting for the average worker. Are you insane? Are you crazy? But they're not going to say that stuff about, you know, what we're paying CEOs, right? Top CEOs see nearly 31% pay increase in 2021, studies show. Median pay for the top 100 CEOs in the United States reached $20 million last year, up 30.8% from 2020, according to data from a new study from Equilar. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> That's lovely. Why don't we tell them that their wages should be stagnant or should go down? Uh, just stunning stuff, guys. You know, you couldn't make that up if you wanted to. And here you can see the average, basically, cost of utilities, cost of living, okay? Gasoline, food at home, and electricity. Take a look at how this has soared. So you see the last time it was this high was in around 1980. And so it has soared in 2022 to over 30%. That is a 30% year over year increase in just utilities. We know housing prices have gone up as well. And so this is just insane. While, of course, wages remain stagnant. And so it's just going to be a bloodbath for the average person that is not already very wealthy. Here from Market Watch, wholesale prices surge again and signal inflation is still bubbling up in the U.S. economy. And so other people have said this as well. Michael Burry has indicated that we have not seen the bottoming out yet. We have not reached the bottom of this. It's going to continue to get worse before it gets better. Um, here we have the Wall Street Journal. JP Morgan profit drops 28% as bank signals concern on economy. Bank sets aside another 428 million for potential loan losses. So they're gearing up for losses. This is from just this morning. JP Morgan Chase and Company reported a 28% decline in its second quarter profit Thursday. The nation's biggest bank set aside another $428 million to cover potential future loan losses, a signal it has grown more dour on the U.S. economic outlook. And in my prior video, I have a clip of Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, essentially saying that we can see this hurricane barreling down the road at us. We don't know when exactly it's going to hit, but it's sort of the perfect storm the perfect economic storm because of things like the um, COVID lockdowns and how that has disrupted supply chains and just kind of created this fiasco. That dragged down profit, which fell to $8.65 billion, or $2.76 per share, falling short of the uh, $2.89 per share forecast by analysts surveyed by FactSet. JP Morgan shares down 29% so far this year, fell 3.5% in pre-market trading Thursday. Recession fears have weighed on the bank, causing its shares to underperform its peers and the broader market. A year ago, the bank pulled $3 billion out of its loan loss reserves due to the economy's rapid recovery recovery, quote unquote, from the pandemic, pushing up profit to 1195, uh, $11.95 billion or 3.78 per share. Revenue rose 1% to $30.72 billion. That missed the $31.81 billion analysts had expected. Consumers increased spending on JP Morgan credit cards and kept paying their bills on time, even as the bank moved to prepare for potential future losses. Market volatility created a boon for trading operations, but dried up the advisory fees for initial public offerings and big deals. Increased interest rates mean its profitability on lending increased, but mortgage underwriting plunged. 
The unusual atmosphere has created a divide in the economic views of bank executives, putting an extra spotlight on this season's earning reports. JP Morgan Chief Executive Jamie Dimon has said he saw a quote unquote economic hurricane on the horizon, but he wasn't sure how serious it would be. In the consumer bank, revenue fell 1% and profit dropped 45%, largely reflecting a release of funds set aside for soured loans in the second quarter of 2021. Spending on Chase credit cards rose 21% from a year ago. That is insane, and 15% from the first quarter, but fees collected on cards dropped. So that shows people are relying on credit cards more and more. Bigger ticket loans slumped with mortgage originations down 45% and auto loan and lease origination down 44%. In the corporate and investment bank, revenue fell 10% while profit dropped 26%. Fees from Wall Street trading rose 15% thanks to volatile markets and interest rate swings. Investment banking fees dropped 54%, reflecting a slowdown in corporate deal making and stock sales from last year's feverish pace. Revenue increased 8% in the commercial bank and 5% in asset and wealth management. Total loans increased 6% and were more profitable. The Federal Reserve raised rates by half a percentage point in May and another 0.75 point in June. Another hike is expected this month. That allows banks to charge more interest on loans even as they are slow to increase the rate they pay on deposits. Isn't that lovely? The bank's net interest margin, a measure of what it collects on loans minus what it pays for deposits, rose 1.80% from 1.67% at the end of March. Loans deemed uncollectible fell from a year ago to $657 million. With the $428 million reserve bill, the bank's total credit costs were $1.1 billion in the quarter. The bank said it was temporarily suspending stock buybacks to retain more capital. Last month's stress test showed the biggest banks would need to hit higher capital requirements. Interesting indeed. Now, uh, this is from Comptroller Brad Lander in New York. The extraordinary surge in median asking rents continued last month. Over the last 12 months, median asking rents in New York City have risen by 29%. This is a housing crisis. Yes. <laughs> and it is not just in New York, by the way. This is nationwide. You had um, large investment firms like BlackRock coming in and buying single family homes and then raising rents 40%, which is insane. Um, or they're just totally uh, pricing people out of the housing market. You know what the World Economic Forum said, you will own nothing and you'll be happy. And that's what they're doing by buying up all the single family homes. They're making it impossible for the average person to be able to compete with them. They were offering things like cash. They were paying well more than the asking price of the house. So a normal family that wanted to purchase the house, they cannot complete. They can't compete against BlackRock who can offer money or more than the asking price. So they were doing that deliberately to buy up all of the property. Why? Because that is a physical hard asset that will continue to earn money. And they knew what was going to happen in the future with the economy. So they were setting themselves up to have physical assets as inflation rises and the value of the dollar goes down. Here we have from the Associated Press uh, from just this morning, long lines are back at U.S. food banks as inflation hits high. It's so sad. Long lines are back at food banks around the United States as working Americans overwhelmed by inflation turn to handouts to help feed their families. With gas prices soaring along with grocery costs, many people are seeking charitable food for the first time and more are arriving on foot. Yeah, because they can't afford to pay for the gas. And meanwhile, the Biden administration continues to give money to the Ukraine as Americans are losing everything. 
unbelievable. Inflation in the United States is at a 40-year high, and gas prices have been surging since April of 2020, with the average cost nationwide briefly hitting $5 a gallon in June. Rapidly rising rents and an end to federal COVID relief have also taken a financial toll. The food banks, which had started to see some relief as people returned to work after pandemic shutdowns, are struggling to meet the latest need, even as federal programs provide less food to distribute grocery store donations wane and cash gifts don't go nearly as far uh, Thomasina John was among hundreds of families lined up in several lanes of cars that went around the block one recent day outside St. Mary's Food Bank in Phoenix. John said her family had never visited a food bank before because her husband had easily supported her and their four children with his construction work, quote, but it's really impossible to get by now without some help, unquote, said John, who traveled with a neighbor to share gas costs as they either under a scorching desert sun. The prices are way too high. Uh, Jesus Pasqual was also in the queue. Quote, it's a real struggle, unquote, said Pasqual, a janitor who estimated he spends several hundred dollars a month on groceries for him, his wife, and their five children, ages between 11 and 19 years old. The same scene is repeated across the nation, where food bank workers predict a rough summer keeping ahead of demand. The surge in food prices comes after state governments ended COVID disaster declarations that temporarily allowed increased benefits under SNAP, the federal food stamp program covering some 40 million Americans. Quote, it does not look like it's going to get better overnight, unquote, said Katie Fitzgerald, president and chief operating officer for the National Food Bank Network Feeding America. Quote, demand is really making the supply challenges complex, unquote. And you can see pictures here of the long queues. Guys, this line is going all the way down here and around the building. It is insane. Charitable food distribution has remained far above amounts given away before the COVID pandemic, even though demand tapered off somewhat late last year. Feeding America officials say second quarter data won't be ready until August, but they're hearing anecdotally from food banks nationwide that demand is soaring. The Phoenix Food Bank's uh, main distribution center doled out food packages to 4,271 families during the third week in June. That is a 78% increase over the 2,396 families served during the same week last year, said St. Mary's spokesperson Jerry Brown. So that's basically an 80% increase in one year of people needing to go to food banks to get food handed out to them. That is so sad. More than 900 families line up at the distribution center every weekday for an emergency government food box stuffed with goods such as canned beans, peanut butter, and rice, said Brown. St. Mary's adds products purchased with cash donations as well as food provided by local supermarkets like bread, carrots, and pork chops for a combined package worth about $75. Distribution by the Alameda County Community Food Bank in Northern California California has ticked up since hitting a pandemic low at the beginning of this year, increasing from 890 households served on the third Friday in January to 1,410 households on the third Friday in June, said Marketing Director Michael Altvest. At the Houston Food Bank, the largest food bank in the U.S., where food distribution levels earlier in the pandemic briefly peaked at a staggering 1 million pounds a day, an average of 610,000 pounds is now being given out daily. That is up from about 500,000 pounds a day before the pandemic, said spokeswoman Paula Murphy. 
Murphy said cash donations have not eased, but inflation ensures that they do not go as far. Food bank executives said the sudden surge in demand caught them off guard. Quote, last year, we'd expected a decrease in demand for 2022 because the economy had been doing so well, said Michael Flood, CEO at the LA Regional Food Bank. Quote, this issue with inflation came on pretty suddenly. A lot of these people who are working and did okay during the pandemic and maybe even saw their wages go up, said Flood, but they have also seen food prices go up well beyond their budgets. The LA bank gave away about 30 million pounds of food during the first three months of this year, slightly less than the previous quarter, but still far more than the 22 million pounds given away during the first quarter of 2020. Feeding America's Fitzgerald is calling on USDA and Congress to find a way to restore hundreds of millions of dollars worth of commodities recently lost with the end of several temporary programs to provide food to people in need. USDA commodities, which generally can represent as much as 30% of the food the banks disperse, accounted for more than 40% of all food distributed in the fiscal year 2021 by the Feeding American Network. Quote, there is a critical need for the public sector to purchase more food now, unquote, said Fitzgerald. During the Trump administration, USDA bought several billions of dollars in pork, apples, dairy, potatoes, and other products in a program that gave most of it to food banks. The Food Purchase and Distribution Program, designed to help American farmers harmed by tariffs and other practices of U.S. trade partners, has since ended. There was a $1.2 billion authorized for the 2019 fiscal year, and another $1.4 billion authorized for fiscal 2020. Another temporary USDA Farmers to Families program provided emergency relief to more than 155 million food boxes for families in need across the U.S. during the height of the pandemic uh, before ending in May of 2021. For now, there's enough food, but there might not be in the future, said Michael G. Manning, President and CEO of the Greater Baton Rouge Food Bank in Louisiana, he said high fuel costs also make it far more expensive to collect and then distribute food. The USDA's COVID food assistance program, which included farmers to families, was a boon for the Alameda County Community Food Bank, providing 5 billion pounds of commodities over a single year, said spokesman Altfest, so losing that was a big hit. Alfes said as many as 10% of the people now seeking food are first timers and a growing number are showing up on foot rather than in their cars to save gas. So you have people who have never had to get any kind of assistance before, people who never had to go to a food bank now showing up and showing up on foot. The food they get from us is helping them save already stretched budgets for other expenses like gas, rent, diapers, and baby formula, he said. Meanwhile, food purchases by the bank have jumped from a monthly average of 250000 before the pandemic to as high as $1.5 million now because of food prices. Rocketing gasoline costs forced the bank to increase its fuel budget by 66%. Supply chain issues are also a problem, requiring the food bank to become more aggressive with procurement. Quote, we used to reorder when our inventory dropped to three weeks worth. Now we reorder up to six weeks out. He said the food bank has already ordered and paid for whole chicken, stuffing, cranberries, and other holiday feast items it will distribute for Thanksgiving, the busiest time of the year. At the Mexican American Opportunity Foundation in Montbello, east of LA, workers say they are seeing many families, along with older people like Diane Martinez, who lined up one recent morning on foot. Some of the hundreds of mostly Spanish-speaking recipients had cars parked nearby. They carried cloth bags, cardboard boxes, or shoved push carts to pick up food packages from the distribution site the LA Bank serves. The prices of food are so high, and they're going up higher every day, said Martinez, who expressed gratitude for the bags of black beans, ground beef, and other groceries. I'm so glad they're able to help us. So this is just insane. 
and it's probably going to continue to get worse. And here is an, another article from CNBC. Copper prices are signaling that investors are bearish on the economy, strategist says. This is from yesterday. Copper is seen as a leading indicator of economic health because of its use in many sectors. At the moment, prices are falling, even though there's little indication of demand falling sharply or supply increasing, said Daniel Hines of ANZ. But James Can, head of Asia Basic Materials Research at UBS, said COVID curbs in China could dampen demand for industrial commodities despite Beijing's plans to stimulate its economy through infrastructure. Falling cooper prices, copper prices suggest investors are negative on the outlook for the economy, a commodity, commodity strategist at ANZ Bank said. Copper is seen as a leading indicator of economic health because of its use in many sectors. In fact, it's the opposite. We're actually seeing signs of, in China of that demand picture improving, he said. But investors have taken the view that tightening monetary policy will lead to lower growth, and that has been reflected in copper prices, he told CNBC's Street Signs Asia on Tuesday. Quote, it's telling me that investors are particularly bearish about the economic outlook. The price of the red metal logged its biggest quarterly drop since 2011 in the second quarter of this year, according to Reuters. Three-month copper on the London Metal Exchange was 7,341 per ton on Thursday morning in Asia, having fallen sharply since June. Copper actually looks, quote, relatively promising, unquote, Hines said. He acknowledged the copper market's performance depends on how global sentiment changes as the U.S. Federal Reserve hikes interest rates, but said supply issues are likely to keep the market tight and fiscal stimulus measures in China over the next 6 to 12 months will boost demand. Chinese President Xi Jinping called for an all-out effort to construct infrastructure in April, and Reuters reported that the country will set up a state infrastructure investment fund. Oh, interesting. Speaking of China... This is from the uh, South China Morning Post. China facing more economic woes ahead of GDP release with mortgage boycott in over 80 cities. Buyers of over 230 properties in 86 cities have joined together to collectively refuse to make mortgage payments for unfinished pre-sold units unless construction resumes. So that's why they want to boost their infrastructure because of this boycott. China is set to announce its second quarter economic growth figure on Friday with Chinese data provider Wind forecasting 1.1% percent year-on-year growth. So this is from today. China's economy, which is on course to record its lowest quarterly growth rate in two years, is facing fresh risks from an unfolding mortgage boycott quickly spreading across the country. In the past week, buyers of more than 230 properties in 86 cities have joined together to collectively refuse to make mortgage payments for unfinished pre-sold units unless construction resumes, according to real-time updates on software development platform GitHub under the, quote, we need home unquote project the crisis further adds to concerns over financial and social stability of the world's second largest economy following a cash crisis at rural banks in two provinces especially at a particularly sensitive moment ahead of a key communist party gathering later this year it exposes more financial weakness and is uh, set to already affect uh, to affect already shaking confidence in the system, according to independent economist Hong Hao. Quote, Banks will have to write down loans, affecting their capital sufficiency and lending ability at a time when bank lending is most needed to sustain growth. Unquote. The current economic slowdown brought on by repeated lockdowns under China's zero COVID strategy has weighed on both home buyers and real estate developers. Developers in China have been struggling since last year following Beijing's regulatory crackdown as part of its deleveraging efforts and moves to contain soaring property prices. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Let's move on. 
uh, China set to reveal very bad economic picture after COVID lockdowns. Well, gee, guys, I mean, who could have guessed? Who would have thought? <laughs> China is set to report a grim second quarter economic performance Friday, adding to concerns about the prospect of a global recession after COVID lockdowns in major cities hobbled trade and daily life. The world's second largest economy may have contracted in three months ending in June, experts say, though Beijing is likely to report modest growth. Quote, the government will not acknowledge a contraction, unquote, said Max Zenglein, chief economist at the Mercantur Institute for China Studies. He added, quote, the further growth is from zero, the less credible the official figure will be, unquote. The sharp slowdown is a painful setback for China, which last year was leading the pack of major economies in its rebound from the pandemic. Since then, countries such as the U.S. have largely reopened, but Beijing's leaders have doubled down on their zero COVID approach of stamping out every outbreak through draconian measures arguing too many will die if China were to lift restrictions and reopen. This strategy has become increasingly controversial and economically damaging. The arrival of more infection variants this year has meant longer and more severe lockdowns are needed to bring outbreaks to heal. The two-month lockdown of China's most populous city, Shanghai, was particularly devastating. Last week, China's premier, uh, Li Ki Kuang visited the coastal city of Fuzhou to meet with officials from across the southeastern industrial belt about how to stabilize the economy. Well, maybe stop with your ridiculous lockdowns. According to the officials in Hua News Agency, Li said the situation was at a critical point and urged officials to steer the economy back on track. Photographs in state media, yeah, they have state media, showed Li in meetings in Fuzhou where no one was wearing a mask, one of several maskless publicity appearances he has made recently. These have been interpreted by some as a show of support by Li toward a faster return to normalcy, even as his boss, Chinese President Xi Jinping, has declared the nation's continued commitment to quote-unquote zero COVID. The repeated lockdowns have laid low the economy over recent months, leaving many people unemployed and underemployed, especially in service industries. Yeah. The jobless rate of people ages 16 to 24 in cities reached 18.4% in May, the highest since Beijing started to publish the measure in 2018. In April, not a single automobile was sold in Shanghai with the city's 25 million residents confined to their homes. Quote, the Chinese economy is in a very bad shape now, unquote, said Tin Lei Huang, research professor at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington. Quote, consumer demand is very weak. Huang said he expects China to miss its target of 5.5% economic growth for the full year because of the severity of their lockdowns. About 4% will be more realistic, he said. Quote, even in the most optimistic scenario, China will not be able to achieve its growth target for the full year. The bleak picture is a far cry from little more than a decade ago when China was routinely posting growth closer to exceeding 10%. Yeah, isn't that nice? Because of their slave labor. The lockdowns have interrupted factory production, snarling supply chains, and delaying the shipment of goods to the rest of the world. These supply problems have been a major driver of U.S. inflation, which has soared to 9.1%. Consumer prices in China are up uh, 2.5% because of depressed demand. Shanghai started to reopen at the beginning of June, but the arrival of the BA.5 COVID variant is threatening new lockdowns. In the northwestern city of Lanzhou has put four of its districts under a seven-day lockdown. Shanghai returned some housing complexes to lockdown while ordering millions of people to be tested again. Guys, that's what tyranny looks like, okay? And so this is really sad. But what you can see is globalism has been a major problem. So many U.S. companies have outsourced manufacturing to China that when China does things, it now affects us. This is the cause of our supply chain crisis. It is China, and that is thanks to globalism. Moving to Business Insider. 
I'm an economist who's been arguing against these doom and gloom predictions for years. Here's why I now think the U.S. economy is hurtling toward a recession. So you have somebody that is usually very optimistic and doesn't like these doom and gloom projections now saying that things are going to get bad. I have for a long time been an optimist when it comes to the economy. When others argued in the years following the 2008 crisis that a recession was nigh, I maintained an upbeat economic view. More recently, I've generally been positive during the pandemic and even during the depths of the lockdowns and as various government support programs rolled off. However, I'm starting to change my outlook and for several reasons, I now believe a recession is more likely than not. Let's start with the most obvious issue for the economy, the Federal Reserve. The Fed is in the risk management business, balancing the various threats to the long-term health of the U.S. economy and adjusting its support accordingly. If the biggest threat is a slowing economy, it can lower interest rates and use its tools to add fuel to the financial system. If the threat is higher inflation, it can raise interest rates and slow the economy, cooling off prices in the process. In recent years, low inflation and weak global growth meant that the Fed's risk management approach was tilted toward keeping interest rates low and stimulating the economy, meaning printing money, right? Um, quantitative easing forever. Every time the market or economy seemed to stumble, the Fed was there. Stock sell-off, a hiccup in the housing market, the Fed could be counted on to step in in metal or provide support. But today, that calculus has shifted. It's clear the Fed Chairman Jerome Powell and other Fed officials believe that slowing down red hot prices and lowering expectations for continued price growth is their most important task. They've launched an aggressive campaign of interest rate hikes to get this problem under control and seem committed to the task, even if it means pushing the economy into a recession. Just look at recent comments from Powell, quote, is there a risk we would go too far? Certainly there's a risk, but the bigger risk is we would fail to restore price stability, end quote. Or a recent speech from the Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester, in which she argued that even in the face of a weakening economy, the Fed's model showed that, quote, the more costly error is assuming inflation expect expectations are anchored when they are not, unquote. Mester's last point on inflation expectations expectations is important. The Fed is not just trying to tackle actual inflation, but also prevent people's expectations of future inflation from increasing. In the Fed's opinion, if households expect higher prices in the future, they will be more likely to accept higher prices now, causing an ever-increasing cycle of inflation that is harder to break. Assume the Fed can walk through two doors. Behind door number one, the Fed raises interest rates enough to bring inflation down, but that pushes the economy into recession in the process. Behind door number two, the Fed fails to tighten enough, and as a result, inflation expectations increase. When faced with these two choices, the Fed is saying quite clearly they will walk through door number one. A policy mistake that results in recession is preferable to the alternative, allowing inflation expectations to become unanchored. The Fed has been signaling an aggressive push to cool inflation for months, but the more worrying issue is that the commitment to these interest rate hikes comes at a time when the economic data should push them to do less. Previously, I've argued that despite the Fed's push to wrangle inflation, the economy was in a strong enough place to survive rate hikes. But now, the calculus has changed. The economy is not in a recession right now, but the Fed can push it in this direction if it's not careful. In light of these issues, it's clear the Fed's outlook for the economy over the course of the year is too rosy. In the latest summary of economic projections, the Fed's estimate for 2022 GDP growth is 1.7%. But GDP growth for the first quarter was negative 1.6%. And the Atlanta Fed's GDP Now estimate, which provides a real-time estimate of this quarter's growth, is suggesting negative 2.1% for the second quarter. So that's two quarters in the red. Doing the math, the GDP would need to drastically rebound to more than 5% in the second half of 2022 to achieve the Fed's full-year estimate. Anything is possible, 
But the more likely outcome is that the Fed will cut its GDP outlook again in September, even while planning more rate hikes. That is not exactly a good signal, in indeed. So you can read the rest of this article yourself. I will include the, looks for, the links for everything in the video description. Moving on to the Gateway Pundit, which I'm not really a fan of, but I figured I'd include it. Biden economy, PPI inflation index out today, highest since March, an all-time high. Yesterday's report on the consumer price index was horrible. Today's results for the PPI are just as bad. Yesterday's inflation, as measured by CPI, was horrible. Biden's inflation is at a 40-year high, not since 1981 have we seen such high inflation. Today, the Bureau of Labor Statistics released its latest results for the producer producer price index in June. This measurement is the largest increase since March when the PPI was reported at an all-time high. The PLL shares, quote, the producer price index for final demand increased 1.1% in June, seasonally adjusted, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reported today. The rise followed advances of 0.9% in May and 0.4% in April. On an adjusted basis, final demand prices moved up 11.3% for the 12 months ending in June, the largest increase since a record 11.6% job in March of 2022. In June, three-fourths of the advance in the index for final demand was due to a 2.4% rise in prices for final demand goods. The index for final demand services increased 0.4%. Prices for final demand, less foods, energy, and trade services moved up 0.3% in June after advancing 0.4% in May and April. For the 12 months ending in June, the index for final demand, less foods, energy, and trade services rose 6 point four percent stock prices are expected to fall as a result and a hundred basis point increase in rates is now expected that is insane uh, he says biden has no idea what he is doing if his goal is to build the u.s economy if his goal is to destroy the economy he is right on track but it's not just joe biden it is not just democrats it is republicans as well they all do this because the rich get richer as the rest of us get destroyed kamala harris is so condescending we'll just let her speak for herself before i begin i will address this month's cpi report there is no question that we still have work to do but it is important to note that these numbers do not fully reflect the recent drop in gas prices. <laughs> Average national gas prices have fallen every day for nearly 30 days. Since mid-June, prices are down 40 cents a gallon. Fighting inflation is one of our administration's top economic priorities, which is why we have taken action to lower the cost of living for Americans, millions of Americans. Yeah, right. We are releasing 1 million ba barrels of oil a day from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to lower prices at the pump. We have reduced high-speed internet bills for millions of Americans. And we passed a tax cut to give working families up to $8,000 a year, which means giving folks more room in their budget. This is absurd. This is not happening. Nobody is seeing any kind of financial breaks in this economy. No. This is nothing. They're doing nothing to help people. They just want to make it sound like they are. To buy food, medication, and school supplies for their children. No, all of those costs have gone up. Medication costs have soared, food prices have soared, and so has college tuition. President Joe Biden and I are always fighting to make sure that working families can get ahead. No, you're not. You are fighting for the largest corporations and the wealthiest people. They are the only ones getting ahead right now. And stay ahead. And that is why we continue to call on Congress to pass legislation to lower the price <sighs> of prescription drugs, of health care, and the other everyday essentials that will meet the needs of American families. Wow. First of all, she looks like she's reading from a teleprompter. Second, this is more of a centrally planned economy. This is socialism and communism. It isn't the answer. 
you know, we are in such debt. This nation is in debt to the tune of trillions of dollars. They just continue to print money and it just and then they're they're shocked by the results. Um, inflation continues to hit hard. Groceries up 12% in the past year. Biggest annual increase since 1979. Chicken up 19% in the past year. Biggest increase ever in history so since we started reporting. Gas up 60%, biggest since 1981. Electricity up 14%, biggest since 2006. Rent up 5.8%, biggest since 1989. And of course, Course, none of the wages are up. The cost of living continues to rise and wages remain stagnant or decrease. Um, the, one of the best things you can do if you have the ability is to invest in a chicken that can produce food, meat, and also eggs. Just kind of throwing that out there. And finally, we have uh, this article from the American Spectator from yesterday, How to Cure Inflation, Take the Power of the Purse from the Democrats by Eliminating Their House Majority. The Bureau of Labor Statistics released two reports Wednesday morning that confirmed the fiscal incompetence of the Biden regime and its Confederates on Capitol Hill. The BLS report of the Consumer Price Index rose yet again in June, quote, over the last 12 months, the All Items Index increased 9.1% before seasonal adjustments. Unquote. The BLS also released its real earnings summary, quote, real average hourly earnings decreased 3.6% seasonally adjusted from June 2021 to June 2022. So real earnings are down while the cost of living is up. In May, President Joe Biden announced, quote, I want every American to know that I'm taking inflation very seriously and it's my top domestic priority, unquote. Other than blame shifting and bluster, however, his plan to fix it has been all but invisible. Consequently, a number of polls indicate that a majority of Americans believe Biden and the Democrats bear responsibility for inflation. Indeed, a recent INI slash TIPP poll found that 53% of Democrats blame Biden, his own party. His statement regarding the BLS reports will not reassure many of these people. Quote, today's data does not reflect the full impact of nearly 30 days of decreases in gas prices that have reduced the price of the pump by about 40 cents <laughs> since mid-June. Those savings, 40 cents? Oh my God are providing important breathing room for American families. Importantly, today's report show what economists call annual core inflation came down for the third month in a row. No, it hasn't. And it's the first month since last year where the annual quote-unquote core inflation rate is below 6%. Not. This combination of denial and deflection won't inspire confidence in Americans who are paying more and more for everything they buy. As to his boast about the 40 cent reduction at the pump, it's a fraction of the huge spike in gas prices that drivers have endured. And decreases in core inflation, which does not include energy and food prices, won't impress Americans who are paying 12.2% more for food at home than they paid last year. June. According to the BLS report, this is the largest 12-month increase since the period ending of April 1979. Yeah. In his Wednesday statement, Biden reiterated his claim that tackling inflation was his top priority. But the reality is that neither he or his fellow Democrats in Congress will ever get inflation under control because they don't know what causes it. They blame it on foreign wars, greedy corporations, supply chain problems, spendthrift consumers, price gouging retailers ad infinitum. These claims are based on their sheer ignorance of fundamental economics. <laughs> yeah. Nobel laureate Milton Friedman explained inflation five decades ago, quote, it is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. It's always and everywhere a result of too much money, of a more rapid increase in the quantity of money than output. Moreover, in the modern era, the important next step is to re uh, recognize that today governments control the quantity of money. So that as a result, inflation in the U.S. is made in Washington and nowhere else, unquote. 
This is self-evidently true and was clearly demonstrated the last time inflation got out of control during the Carter era. Yeah, but we don't have a Paul Walker today. But there is always an economist or two who will be out uh, out there who will tell the Democrats what they want to hear. This service is often provided by another Nobel laureate, Paul Krugman, this doofus, who confidently opined last fall that inflation was transitory. Oh yes, Janet Yellen said the same thing. Tweeted the party line Wednesday morning, quote, today's hot inflation number is already out of date, not reflecting falling gas prices and other factors that have recently gone into reverse. Verse. Krugman knows better. All BLS reports contain information that is a week or two old, a minuscule decline in historically high gas prices after the data was compiled is meaningless. This is particularly true if the decline resulted from gimmicks like raiding the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. But Biden and his accomplices in Congress will use Krugman's partisan opinion to justify another harebrained scheme to spend their way out of inflation. Indeed, according to the Washington Post, they're already planning to do just that. Oh, good God. With inflation on the rise and the threat of a recession looming, congressional Democrats are scrambling to revive their long-stalled economic spending package. Print more money, guys. Duh. Hoping to deliver relief, deliver relief to Americans whose finances have soared because of their policies during months of political bickering. The chief obstacle remains Senator Joe Manchin. Manchin has remained steadfast in his belief the U.S. government should spend less and raise more than others in his party prefer. That Manchin has to spend so much time explaining the obvious to his Senate colleagues suggests that the insanity will never end as long as Biden and the Democrats possess the power to spend money that they don't have and isn't theirs. But the midterms offer an opportunity to stop the madness. Only the House of Representatives is authorized by the Constitution to originate money bills, legislation that raises and spends revenue. Thus, the voters can hit the brakes on inflation by depriving Democrats of their House majority in November. This shouldn't be a heavy lift. The Republicans need to flip fewer than 10 seats or so to regain the House majority they lost in 2018. 538 gives the GOP an 87% chance of reaching that goal. Moreover, this seems to be the general consensus among political prognosticators. So if you don't like runaway inflation, Think of the Democrat Party as an adolescent carrying a credit card with no limit. They'll never stop using it until the adults take it from them. The midterms provide the perfect opportunity to do so. But what I would say to that is the Republicans are not any better. The, the entire problem is the government, generally speaking, is too massive. The government has continued to grow, and with that, they have continued to uh, get more and more central control. And the centralized control is a bad thing. We do not actually have capitalism. We do not actually have a laissez-faire free markets. We have constant government intervention that has caused most of the problems to begin with, including the subprime mortgage crisis of 2008. Do you know that it was actually their diversity quotas that caused that? They were demanding that banks, so you had the government telling banks what to do, putting regulations on them, demanding that they give loans to people in low-income areas who could not afford them. And so, of course, when they default, it causes a massive problem, but that was just the beginning. These diversity quotas, equity, that has only gotten worse over time. So no, I don't think either party is trustworthy and I don't think either one of them is gonna be much better than the other. They're, the, they're just two wings of the same bird. However, you cannot deny that things were not as bad under the Trump administration you know, at least the economy was doing somewhat decent. So anyways, if you enjoyed this video, I know this was really long, but it's a lot of information, you know, hit the like button, that helps, leave a comment, subscribe, share the video, and the links for everything is in the video description.